welcome to the Metal Voice. Today on the show, I'll let everybody guess. Lips from Anvil, always a pleasure. The one website, the Metal Voice, that always promotes Anvil on every show. We try to always slip Anvil in no matter what we do. Lips, we do like a product placement. Like <laughs> Alan, Alan will put a little Anvil, you know, in the corner somewhere and... Or we interviewing somebody, something and something all of a sudden, something. like an album will pop by, you know. <laughs> all right, man. Pretty exciting stuff. You know, uh, I don't know what to call it a tour because you didn't call it a tour. It's a regional tour, we'll call it, right, Lips? Yeah, that's it. It's regional. It's, it's regional. just like you're going back to the late seventies. You're just it's, it's Ontario and Quebec, like what, what was in the late seventies. No different. <laughs> yeah, so it seems like. It. Not much has changed. <laughs> Except the October mustache 12th, is no it. longer there. <laughs> the mustache is gone. Yeah, and so is the electric circle. So what the hell? <laughs> the, the gas works is gone, right? Yeah. I'm sure you played there many times uh, back in the day. Yeah. In, in Quebec. Probably too many times. <laughs> <laughs> did you, did you, I think once you said you saw Rush play there with John Retzi, the original drummer. Is that true? No, it was someone else. I knew it was someone else. Yeah, it wasn't me. I I did never saw Rush at the Gasworks. I I saw Rush at my high school. Oh, oh, okay. maybe that. I mean, it was yeah. That's like nineteen seventy four, maybe seventy five, maybe no earlier. No, it has to be like seventy two, maybe. So, I mean, John Retzi was a drummer, right? Yeah. The, the original yeah. drummer, right? Yeah. That's when they start. They, they'd open their set with um, with the the thing from Superman. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane. <laughs> and yeah, then it's the first time I heard uh, that. Diddly, 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 you know that song? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, that's right. That's Finding that's My right. Way, right? It's finding that's my Finding way. My Way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That must have been pretty cool. I mean, back then when you saw Rush, and just I'm just curious. Like, did you think, man, this this band is going to be who they are today? I wouldn't have th thought they were as going to be as big as they got, but certainly they were it, it was it was it was the best that uh that you might see in your high school. You know what I mean? Like and you knew it. Like it was really heavy. And at that day and age, you didn't see stuff like that. I mean, there were other bands in, you know, but not like that. Not like that, man. You know, not really, really loud. It wasn't metal yet. It was still, it was still the hard rock, you know? So it was, you know, what did you see in the bar, in the, in the schools at that time? Brutus, right? Uh, Carol Pope, Rough oh, Trade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm just thinking about other bands that you Max saw Webster. around here. No, that came later. That yeah. came way later than me. Uh, they they came after Rush. At least in my in my view, that it was probably didn't. Yeah, they d definitely came after Rush. Yeah. How old were you? How old were you when you were, when you saw Rush? Do you remember? Uh, it would have been grade eleven or twelve. So I was already 16, 17, at least. Wow. Yeah. Cool. It's, well, they're only four years older than me, so it's <laughs> – they're young guys. <laughs> they were young guys at that, at that, at that point in time. Um, they played what was called the Victory Burlesque House. I went to see them there. And it, it was that was a great show because they had uh, uh, Blood Rock open for them. I don't know Blood Rock, Alan. Yeah, I know. Well, <laughs> I wouldn't expect you to. You're not old enough. <laughs> I don't know Blood Rock. Did they get any traction, Blood Rock? Here in Canada, probably not. Okay. That doesn't mean that they weren't. They were a significant band. They were produced by the same, uh, by Terry Knight, the same guy that produced uh, Grand Funk. Okay. All right. They're a hard rock band. I, I really like them. 
like I do. I, I don't know about, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I, I'm, I'm a fan of blood rock. I, I enjoy them. There we go. That's because, one for people to start Googling. Yeah, <laughs> they, they can look it up and it's an, it's an old seventies, uh, seventies rock band. Were they a Canadian band? Uh, oh no, they're American. Obviously, yeah. Terry Knight's managing them. Yeah, that's what I was figuring. Yeah, <laughs> that's pretty cool. So your high school. I mean, was there any inspiration? You see Rush playing, you go, you know what? I want to do what they're doing. I want to. I want to no, be Rush. No, I already was doing it long for a long time already. <laughs> no, Rush has not been an inspiration to me. Sorry. Okay. All right. Frank Marino, much more. Yeah, yeah that's Frank. You know, but um, did you ever see Frank? Rush, in the- I, 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 it's not that. I like the English bands. Mm-hmm. You know, I like the stuff that they listen to. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> it, 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 like the, listening to to their versions of what I was listening to. I'd rather listen to what I was listening to, right? Mm-hmm. Right, right. I, I, and I don't mean to be offensive. I mean, it's not, oh, no, no. it's not, it's not, um, it's just, they're okay. I mean, I thought they were pretty, pretty good. Yeah, I, I like April, I always liked April Wine more. Yeah, yeah. yeah. big fan of April Wines. Yeah. First concert I ever saw was April Wine. <laughs> April Wine has been more of an influence to me in right up to today. You know what I mean? I, right. I, uh, I I look at April wine and more 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 special. I know that the rest of the world doesn't, but I do. <laughs> and Frank Marino, did he come by your high school back then? No, no, I never. I I I didn't. The fir- the only time I ever saw Frank Marino was when I opened for him. <laughs> that was when. When was that? In Montreal in 1983. Wow! Wow, that's pretty cool. That must have been the juggernaut era. That's that's exactly what it was. It was great. But yeah, a good uh, good guitarist for sure. Yeah, yeah. I really that that was really that was really cool to 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 see that in its day. Yeah. But that was pretty much it, you know. Didn't really go on continue up much further than that, did it? So. Yeah. No, that was he. We've interviewed Frank. He said that was pretty much the end. He was sick with the corporate world, and that was pretty much the end for him after the, the juggernaut. So, yeah, yeah. Strange be. Dreams was playing everywhere that summer. I mean, you could, you, all the radio was playing. <laughs> and, and you couldn't have frustrated Frank more. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> they pick. Out of all those albums and all those songs, they pick a song that's got no guitar solo. No guitar solo. That's what he mentioned. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> you know, he said the same thing you said, but you know, they they basically made these albums. I guess I guess they front him the money for sure to make those albums, but there was no money after that. There was no money. Just like the same way, you know, you guys kind of, you know, when your first three albums. Maybe there was. Oh, no, hey, hey, th- th- listen, there's money. There is lots of money, but none that goes to the band. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody's making the money. Come on. That's this the way that's the nature of the of the music business. That's the way it's like uh, uh, loan sharking. Right. Hey, right. Give you money for your album and you're going to pay 10 to one back. <laughs> yeah. That's what it works like. Right. I don't think that I don't think that most people really come to understand how the the business actually works. When a record company gives you an advance, let's just use numbers, okay, that are not relevant to Anvil or or necessarily anybody. Let's say they give you ten grand, okay. Well, you're going to pay that ten thousand dollars off by selling ten thousand CDs because they give the band a dollar towards the red line for every CD. So that's what your cut is. One out of the one dollar. Yeah. 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 So while the band is paying off the red line at a dollar per sale, right? The band the, the record company is making $19. Right? So where where's all the money going? 
they give it to you. They gave you the ten grand. There you go. And they always say they're they're magicians at math, the accountants, right? They just kind of, well, you didn't really pay it off yet. Well, you know, there was- oh, the, 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 you never get you're very seldom do uh, royalty advances uh, actually get cleared, and they they never want them to either, because as soon as they do, then they start owing you money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they make the numbers dance on the page and. You know, all all records and CDs going to mom and pop's shops, um, they're not tallied. So you're never going to get paid for them. And, and so, didn't you have an instance where Attic sent out all these promotional copies that they, they charged against you, but they were giving them away as well? Well, that's... That, that's, <laughs> that's another way, right? How, how, about, how about Attic Records doing a backdoor deal with a, a a company in France who pressed a million copies. How about that? Oh. Of picture discs. You know the Anvil picture discs? Yeah. Well, there's about a million of, of, of metal on metal and, and hard and heavy that are out there that were sold at a fraction of the price of a regular, of a regular, uh, uh, um, Vinyl. Of a regular re- release, right? Like everybody's getting black vinyl and they're paying, you know, 12 bucks for the album. But, you know, if you buy the, the picture disc by Anvil, they're five dollars. Oh, well, that's what that's what happened. I remember seeing that. That, that, re- that really vinyl. happened. And, and you know, the, the, the really. Uh, there's no point in talking about no. it. There's no point in talking about it. What, what's what, what's going to change by talking about it? Nothing. There's no more music in there. You know, I'm not, I'm not, no, I never got paid. I still never going to get paid. And and that's, you know, it's 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 so typical of the music business for that kind of that kind of crap to go on, man. It just it, it and and I know I'm not the only one. There's lots of bands that never get paid. I said it in my movie. Ninety percent of bands never get paid. <laughs> So then you fast forward to today and everybody's saying, well, we're not getting paid. We're not getting paid for our albums, but no one ever really got paid. No. You've got to sell millions. A Black Sabbath didn't get paid. Ozzy didn't make money until until Sharon, until Sharon and, and him put together the Blizzard of Oz. Yeah. That's the first time he saw money in all those years. Yeah, but is it talked about? Does anybody know? Do they realize these things? No, man. It it costs money to make somebody a rock star. A lot of money. And to the rock star himself, to the point where they're living in a poor house. Yeah. yeah. Even though they're fucking filthy, filthy famous. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're, they're, they're not really making money. Um and then, of course, what that turned into and in, in what it is now, it's all about the merchandise. It's all about T-shirts. I could give a rat's ass whether the record company's giving me money or not. I make all my all my money from merchandising and playing live. That's how you do it. It's the only way to do it. It's the way all the bands do it, including, including the biggest bands in the world. Why do you think Metallica have pop-up shops before they go play? And what's a pop-up shop? That's so that they can sell their merchandise before the show. Because at the merch- at the, at the show, it's double the price because they, they have to split all the, the take to the promoter. Oh, boy. Now, what, when, when, when let's say it, they're, they're hiring Metallica for the night, it costs the promoter a million bucks. Well, it costs... It cost Metallica a million dollars to put the show on because they've got like 180 fucking roadies and 18 18 wheeler trucks. And it takes 24 hours to set up a fucking stage, you know? So yeah, no kidding. (laughs) It it costs a lot of money, right? Live nation, right? They just announced. Yeah, but that's, that's the way, that's the way it works. So, yeah. What happens is, uh, you know, like or with AC- ACDC, they they manufacture the the horns. You know what I mean? They and they sell them for 15, 20 bucks, and they cost fifty cents. 
yeah. And that's how ACDC, everybody pretty much who walks into that show buys a pair of those horns and they make all the money from the from the merchandise. That's th- th- their own pocket money. So they'll walk out with, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars each, right? Insurance policies that these guys have to pay just to put a show on. Yeah, no cancellations. Of- I mean, it, it's not about cancellations, about if something happens to anybody in that crowd for any reason, the band can become responsible. So the band has to pay a fortune in in insurance to just go play the show. So that's why I'm saying, you know, they get a million bucks, but it, it just costs them $40,000 to insure the show. Yeah. Right? So it's like, you know, people are wondering why it's, you know, two, three hundred dollars for a ticket. Well, there's there you go. Yeah. Everybody's got their fingers in the pie. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Venom used to, you know, use explosives in 82 and 83 that there was. You know, so did we. Come on, man. Thing. But that's, a, you know, like, think about all the clubs we played and that we were using pyrotechnics that were completely illegal through the whole thing. Had anything ever happened to anybody, we would have been fucking cooked. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. You know, and. You, you know, never mind there. setting the place on fire, but somebody getting blown up or 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 injured from the explosion or anything like that, man. You know, our roadie got blown up, but it didn't. He didn't sue us. He blew himself up. <laughs> <laughs> it was his own fault. <laughs> Is it easier traveling like this tour? You know, you're starting October second, twelve, going to November eighteenth. You're doing like you said, Quebec, Ontario. You almost call it the station wagon tour. Is that easier than the old days, or? I uh, know. The thing is, we we're uh, we're we're in the in between um, because this is uh, we just I just got back from Germany. I just finished recording the twentieth album, and uh, that that went really well. And I can tell you this that I can I can honestly say that. It's bookend, bookended our our career in a certain sense. The way we started up out is the way we're ending up. It's actually oh. quite interesting. A complete, a complete circle. So heavy. Yeah. And hard. What do I mean by that? The, what I just recorded is probably going to be this, as accessible, if not more accessible, than metal on metal. Wow. And you're not saying this is the end of Ando, right? That's not what you're saying. Pardon me? When you say book ended, you're well, not saying it's the end. Well, I don't know. Maybe there's another album or two, but what, what I generally mean, what, the way we were, I mean, the, uh, Metal on Metal was my second album, right? right? I'm just generally saying the beginning of my career, and I'm fucking 67, dude. I got, I got, heart, I got heart problems. I don't know how much longer I got. You know what I mean? <laughs> It, 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 life has a beginning, middle, and end. That's the way it works for everybody. No one gets out alive. <laughs> no, no exception. So um, spe- you know, speaking back then, Fortune Fire released in 83. You didn't do any of these 50th anniversary or 40th anniversary tours, I should say, like a lot of bands where they just play a lot of songs off of that no, album. Because, no, because Anvil stayed relevant and we put out albums every couple of years for 45 years yeah. why am i celebrating something that happened in 83 when i've got to promote what i'm doing now doesn't make sense so can it's, we can it's we it's no sense to me can we ex- expect new songs and, this and the audience that we are drawing in this day and age don't even barely know that shit <laughs> that's true i've seen that at the last concert here in montreal that's what it was a lot of younger all young people man they what do they know? they know what we've done recently in recent years since the movie it's actually it's it's remarkable it's 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 uh it's unique to anvil it's not like that for everybody because not everybody had a documentary that did that well. It's just the way it, it's just the way that the, the it played itself out. 
you know. I think it speaks to your work ethic too. You know, you guys are like clocks, right? Every two years, you've got interesting lyrics that tell the story. You got. Oh, we're not. Yeah, but this is this is the thing. Anvil is not a pop band. You know what I mean? We're not. We're not Coldplay. You know what I mean? For sure. You know, uh, and what do I mean by that? We don't. We're not. We're not radio radio friendly never really have been okay so if you're not radio friendly that means you've got to put out albums every year okay if you've yeah. got songs on the radio you can take four years and not bother doing shit for four fucking years not if you don't how do you stay relevant man you've got to keep pumping your name out there and the only way to do that is to put an album out and then you've got promotion right now you're out there. No promotion, no album. You sit and you're dormant. No one knows you're even there. You got to be on the metal boy. Work, man. So, like Motorhead, which is was very, a very, very similar, similar history. Saxon. Like yeah, Saxon. Yeah. Well, now, Saxon how many albums? Uh, Saxon also twenty albums or whatever, and put out albums on, and, and they're not going to sit, you know. I I just don't see, and I don't think really Motorhead ever did it. Did they go ever go back out and do an Ace of Spades tour years? No, they did. No, oh, I, I, right. no, no, no. Oh, they're relevant. Why would they do that? They're going to be promoting their newest album that they just put out, right? <laughs> so speaking of that, Liv, <laughs> they're putting out albums every year and a half. Yeah, yeah. which so, is no, no different than than what what I've been doing. It's what you do if you're if you're a, 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 a you know a, a, an artist a, musician. I guess a non-commercial, non-commercial or non-radio play metal band. That's what you do. You okay. have to prove your prove yourself worthy every year or two with a new album. That's the way you do it. So saying that on this tour that's coming up, can we expect any of the new songs being played? Of course. Well, I- Great. Well, not not from the newest album. No, well, that's no. what he meant. You that's what can't he was do wondering. That. No, you can't do that. I would, and in the old days you could, but that's before social media and people fucking filming every night. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't. Want, I, I really don't want to release new songs by somebody videotaping me with their with their phone at a gig. I'd rather put I'd rather put the real recording out there. You know what I mean? So how how was the recording though? How long did it take? Actually, I was so well prepared this time. I did I finished I finished everything within probably two weeks. Wow. Yeah. I, 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 I think the third week was the final. I pretty much finished. Wow. Um, and I sat around for two weeks in Europe doing fuck all <laughs> because I, I finished way earlier. We booked five weeks and I was done in three. So I don't know. It's just the way it goes. Right. But I'm not I'm not complaining. I'm just saying that that's just the way it went. I'm, I went in really prepared. Um, you know, it only took about two or three days to to put all the bed tracks down. Um 14, 14 songs. Okay, that's a 14. And then for seven days straight, I did all the singing and lead guitar playing. Wow. So half the day I'd play. Well, the way it worked is I went in, sing on the first, at the first, I, I sang two songs. And then the next day I go in in the morning, play my play my two the two solos on the songs that have the singing on then go and sing in the afternoon to make the two next songs so that I can play the solos in the morning so I got I got the 14 songs done in seven days normally I don't uh, I never did things like that I just never did things like that I'm never that prepared but I, I, I honestly this time I I completely pre-wrote the album and had it completely, completely sorted out. 
so that all I had to do was just perform it. That, that was it. There was no uh, creativity. It's it's actually it's completely uh, mechanical. You just got to do the job, right? Get it done. Well, you're hearing you're hearing about you know Stephen Tyler blowing his voice out, and you know sixty seven. It took you seven days to do all the vocals. How how did you do it? Uh well, I don't, I don't, I don't have a problem doing that. I'm not, I'm not hurting. Good. Uh, I I I I quit smoking years ago. I don't know. I don't. I just. It's my fingers hurt more than my throat. <laughs> I'm serious, man. Your fingers hurt the more than you play, I, have, you I suffered more from playing lead guitar than I did from singing because it's much more intense. Because I, when you're attacking to play lead guitar, you're really attacking the neck. It's not. It's not the same as. It's hard to. It's really hard to explain. You're physically, physically pushing your fingers to get that those what you want to get done right and you're doing uh, like my approach i don't i don't pre-plan my solos i create them in the studio so what the what the what the engineer does is he runs the the section where the lead guitar is and i just keep playing the solo over and over again and eventually i get a complete a completed written piece from doing it over and over again and then he find and then it's captured that's it so it's just that you're not playing it once you're playing it 30 times yeah. right so think about what that's doing to your fingers if you're playing the same yeah. fucking solo 30 times 14 days <laughs> yeah for 14 days yeah i mean my calluses are fucking really thick right now because i i had, it was the last thing i just did which made it really, really good to go into rehearsal for the for the shows that we have because I didn't have to work my fingers in to get into shape. Right. They were already there. So it's been the only thing I had to do was listen to the the set again and get it and and sort of clear my head of the the newest work because your all your faculties are zeroed in on what you just did, not on what you used to do. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you have to re, I don't know, re, uh, re reprogram. Re, yeah, reprogram your brain. Reset. Yeah, you got to start playing metal on metal again. You remember the words? Uh, let me hear it once. <laughs> I, I remember when I was you were in Montreal last time. You're promoting, of course, the impact is imminent, right? Yeah. You, you already told me. Jimmy, we got the next album, or right, maybe it was Rob. We got the next album written already, and it's even better than this one. Yeah. That's how prepared you were. Well, that's right, because because of the COVID thing, we um, we started, we really buckled down. I, I, I did the writing of, of three albums in the time that I would do one. Wow. <laughs> it's fucking nuts, man. Like... It's nuts. I, I, I can't, it just, to me, it's fucking, yeah. I've never, I've ne in my career, I've never written so, been in the writing mode for such a long period of time. It's ridiculous. You think about it, it, it over, over 30 songs got written, you know? Yeah. It's a lot, a lot of work, man. A lot of homework, a lot of homework. So what can we expect on this tour? Okay, what? Well, it's not in really, terms of, in like terms I said, of it's not, it's a, you, you, you can expect virtually, it, if you missed us last time, now you're going to see us again doing virtually the same thing. I don't know, maybe there would be a couple, I don't know whether I'm, what I played in Montreal the last time, someone will have to remind me. <laughs> <laughs> then maybe I can change up a couple things, but uh, generally nothing's changed because we haven't put out the new album yet. Although I think we, I don't know if we played Forge and Fire. Did we play Forge and Fire in Montreal last time? I can't remember. I'd have to look it up. I don't, I'm like you. I don't remember. Yeah. The time before, if I remember correctly, I think you played. I think, I, I think we did, this is 13. I don't know. 
And the other question, did we do Ooh Baby or did we do School Love? I don't know. I don't remember. <laughs> so, yeah, there's always little small little nuances, usually with the old stuff that you got to swap it out if you've been there too many times, right? Is this tour like a preparation for something maybe bigger down the road or is it? Uh... I don't know what you mean. What, what is it, you is like, is, you know, this is a smaller run, just like you said, Ontario, Quebec, but is this like kind of working your way up to maybe something happening in the future, a larger tour? Or? Oh, no, 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 no. We're not doing anything until until the, the new album comes out, and that could be not till next summer. So Next summer, okay. Yeah, and, and between, between uh, November and, I guess, May or June, I'm going to be getting a procedure done to my heart, which is oh, man. Oh, I've got I've got this um, I've got atrial fibrillation, which is not a good thing. It's it's uh, they got to put a wire in my in my in my into a vein and then up into my heart and burn a, a little uh, some nerve endings that are make my heart that are making my heart beat irregularly. Oh, and that's how they fix it. It's not open surgery or anything. It's just uh, it's like a, a, a you you go in and two hours out you're out. <laughs> None of yeah, it's, it's but the, the thing is, it's a huge backlog in in patients for because this is really really common. And of course, I'm a baby boomer, and the hospital is packed with us. <laughs> Yeah, that's a whole other discussion. So, the, the, yeah. So, in any case, that's that's what I'm going to be doing, and probably in November and December. And then, after that's done, I'm going to probably begin writing for the next album. Wow! And the next album, the next, the next, next album. album. <laughs> yeah, for 21. Yeah, for the album 21. <laughs> and by the time that we go out on tour for the newest album that I just finished. I will have the new, like, like the last time I'll have the, another new album already written. Amazing. It's, it's a cycle. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I was watching yesterday. I was just, I always try to watch some other interviews or older interviews. And I watched the one with you and Sasha and Rob, you know what? I don't think people understand the depth of the sort of the beginnings of how you guys met Sasha at 13 or 14 or 15 years old. I don't know if I, there's a question here, but I don't think people understand the depth of. Well, the, the thing is, world. everybody goes, hey, man, you know, the typical, the typical attitude of, of jealous. And I'm going to use the word jealous musicians. <laughs> it could have happened to any band. No, no, that's not the way it works. That's like saying every band can make it. Any band can make it, and they all will. No, no, one in a million, and that's what it is. That's exactly what it was, and that's why no one, no one has surpassed the anvil. The story is anvil in in documentaries, and they won't. It's just not going to be possible. That that movie it took took over thirty five years to cultivate. And, and I use the word cultivate. You need a history. You need 12 albums that, that didn't go big. Not two albums, not 10 albums, 12. <laughs> the, the misconception. You guys, you never gone anywhere. Well, I would have to disagree. When we did the movie, we had 12 albums out. We were recording our thirteenth record, but but lips. There's I mean, even more that's to it. Not a failure. I hate to even... tell you that's not fucking failure. <laughs> but there's more to this, and and this is what I I realized yesterday was, Sasha was on the verge of going bankrupt, and you guys gave it all. It was basically a do or die situation for everyone if this movie flopped. I, I yeah, but it, 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 see, but <laughs> in my view, not possible. No, no, no. I get that. I get that. No, but no, in I, Sasha's I, view, I still, in I, Sasha's I, view, I still, I still insist that I. Well, I did. I knew. Yeah. 
I fucking knew <laughs> when that when I met met up with Sasha after not seeing him for for twenty five or more years, and he said uh, after he said s- sat me down at his uncle's place and he goes I'm going to make a movie about you. I broke into tears because I knew my my ship just came in. I knew what it was. I recognized it immediately. Because let's face it, Sasha was worked for Steven Spielberg. We're not talking about some jerk off with a fucking video camera, okay? Like me. We're talking. <laughs> we're, talking <laughs> we're talking about somebody who's working in Hollywood. Somebody who's got their degrees in fucking film school. We're talking about a real fucking situation. <laughs> a Hollywood guy yeah. made a movie about Anvil, not a fucking local guy with a video camera. It's yeah. completely different. So from my perspective, I I could see that. And then to me, I'm going, well, wait a minute. I've got 12 albums and a hard luck story that who's going to fucking surpass that? Yeah, yeah. Underdog story. Everybody loves the underdog. Yeah, yeah. like you're not going to surpass it. Then the other, the, a very important aspect, who's got, who's got, a, who's articulate enough? Who's got the balls? Right? Who's got the balls to admit to the world, hey, I haven't made it. Everybody who makes a fucking documentary, all they do is hype themselves and make themselves stand, 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 look like they've been rock stars since the first day they came out. They don't t- never tell the truth. Yeah, you people you know, are more they, brutal they, than they show. They show gigs with the, that are all packed, and if if they make a video or whatever, everybody's paid to be there. So it's a whole crock of shit. Ne- never works. If it's real and it's true. The other the other thing is uh another important aspect about the the the, the about the Anvil movie, it was written in real time. It was done in real time. Okay, but we, it wasn't like it was planned and it wasn't like it's it, and it was about what's happening now, this moment not what happened 30 years ago the first 10 minutes of the anvil movie talk about about the band's past the rest is all about what we were doing at the moment and that is way more intriguing and way more captivating than watching somebody talk about something in retrospect how many how many years did they follow you three years Wow! I just, I just, a lot of footage. I just love the part I was, I was listening to Sasha talk about his whole experience. It was just mind blowing. Here's a Hollywood, like you said, this Hollywood bigwig. What we just say, a massive guy in Hollywood. He risks it all for you, and then you go. I think is it was it the Keynes Film Festival? I can't remember. It was uh, the Sundance, or I don't remember. He told you. I'm going to submit this to Sundance and you, and you go, okay, <laughs> but you didn't realize there was like 20,000 other submissions. Or no, and yeah, well, it wasn't just that. I thought, I thought it was a shoe in. I didn't know it had to be submitted. And then they had to sit, they had to sit on a fucking, on a, on a, on a, on a board of directors. What? <laughs> I thought it was a shoe in. I thought you would do the movie, you hand it in and away you go. Oh uh, no. <laughs> they have to like the movie and then they schedule it into the into the into the festival but they liked the movie so much it became the it was the it was the year's favorite movie at the at the festival wow. so all the workers all the workers of throughout the whole festival they had an anvil night we were yeah. the only movie to 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 do that i mean there were a lot of things that <laughs> Listen, man. It is magical. It's a one-time deal. Then it's not going to happen again. So when you said you do that, your ship had come in. While you're filming, all the things that happened that you mentioned you know, about the painting that falling, and it's the same painting that you see when you go over to record the CTs, the plays, all the things you know with your father and stuff. Did that reinforce, like, guys, you don't understand what we're dealing with. This is, not only my ship come in, but this is going to happen. It's going to happen big. Did it reinforce you, all these little things you were noticing along the way? Well, the, the thing is, there's a lot of, of um, 
weird, weird things that happen that you're going, something's guiding this. I was, and I'm not religious and, and I wouldn't, I don't know that, it, I, I don't know that it's, it's a God. I, I, I mean, I, I could never answer that question, but I could honestly tell you that it really, really felt like it was being guided somehow. <laughs> like somebody else was watching over and making, making shit happen, you know, like you're going, how, why, how, what the fuck? You know, during the recording, there were, of course, times where the cameras weren't around and stuff, right? So, you know, we go do a gig here in Toronto, and it's got, we load in, and it's got this huge fucking staircase that goes up, goes up a mile into the fucking, up to the fucking club, and we're going, we're just killing ourselves, taking the gear up and down it. Anyway, um, I got this, we got this friend, Mike, who's just a, just a, a, a regular headbanger friend that we've known for quite some time. And he, he offers to take my amp down the stairs. So he get, gets up on the stage. He picks up one of my Fender twins and drops it. Well, <laughs> not a good thing, right? At least not at that moment. That's for sure. And I fucking, I lost it. I fucking lost it, man. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> As it turns out, okay, he paid for all the all the damage and everything. But as it turns out, he went to Japan because he's friends with the loudness, with loudness and stuff like that. So he went and go and visit Japan and he went to see loudness and the the promoters that put it on, these creative, creative man promotion company in Japan. And he makes friends with the guy from the from the promotion company. And the guy he goes, uh, "Why don't you get Anvil here?" And the guy goes, "Anvil?" And he goes, "Yeah, man." He says, uh, "They're they're available." And he goes, "Okay." <laughs> meanwhile, meanwhile, and, and there's the going. Area. We need we need a show to have at the end of the movie of you guys playing in Japan, and we need that show to happen. In sometime in the middle of October. And I'm thinking, how the fuck? What are you thinking, man? Yeah, right. Let me conjure it up. Yeah, right. How the fuck am I going to get a gig in fucking Japan? And why would they just insist? Why would they just put it on in the middle of October? Yeah. Well, what happens is after Mike visited, visited Japan, I get a fucking call. And the guy goes, hi, I'm from Japan. I work for Creative Man uh, Promotion Company. We'd like to bring you to Japan for October 15th. Pretty amazing. Yeah. Like, how do you explain that? Yeah. How do you fucking explain yeah. shit like that, man? destiny and and okay then we're okay then we finally get there and you, we discover we're on at 11 30 in the fucking morning i'm going oh great all this for how many people are going to be here we're like a <laughs> second band on or something like that fuck i'm flipping out right well as it turns out anvil hadn't been there in 25 or plus years everybody wanted to see it because yeah. all these Thousands of kids who never got to see it in its day in right. the 80s are going, fuck, the original Anvil is coming to fucking Japan. So the hall is packed at <laughs> 1130 in the fucking morning. Which you need that scene for the film. What we needed for the film and what all the other support bands who had paid to be on the bill were praying that Anvil drew so that at least there's a fucking crowd. Wow. And that's yeah. why we were put on first thing in the morning. Uh, so there was that respect. There was that honoring your, your history also played into that first slot. That's right. But they don't tell you we were putting you on early so that we can get an audience in here. They're not going <laughs> to tell you that. And I don't know whether I would have agreed to it or not. It's hard to say. <laughs> 
Well, I mean, these are these kind of things you, you can't. There's no. It, it's beyond explanation. Really. And it's it, it's their magical magical aspects of how, how the movie got made. And we're gonna we're gonna leave you with this lips. Uh, and to everyone out there, um, it's Ajax, October the twelfth, Peterborough, Kingston, Pembroke. Quebec City, Trois-Rivières, Montreal, all the way back into Ontario, all the way to Toronto, November 18th. So the tour dates are up. You guys are coming through. It's nice to see you guys uh, come back again to, uh, you know, Quebec, Ontario, which is basically where you started from. In this That's right. And like I said, we've been completing the cycle. <laughs> What's the website? Where do you want people to go and check? It's always been a, a bit of a... Oh, Jesus. Ah, uh, fuck. I don't know. Check Facebook, check Instagram. We don't. I, I'm not running a a, a, a website. I, no point. Facebook does the work. So does Instagram. So do the, all the social medias. You know, even even the uh, YouTube gets sponsored for when they put out an album. So there, there's almost no point in having a website. So uh, find the Anvil Facebook page. Find uh, find. Uh, lips anvil on 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 instagram or or rob rob reiner or <laughs> yeah so it's all there it's all there just type in lips and anvil. yeah just take a look see and all the all the and this stuff's always being posted by the clubs as well so yeah it's good stuff lips we're looking forward to see you guys again on the 22nd yeah, yeah. Yeah, yep. I'm looking Thank forward you. to it too. I, I I love Montreal. It's one of, of course, it's one of my favorites. And man, have I got memories. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, hopefully we'll see you there. Hopefully we can hook up and it, uh, you know wish you a great tour in in advance. Yeah, the, only this time if we're gonna go have dinner, maybe you ought to make reservations. <laughs> yes. Alan wasn't there last time, and we didn't have reservations. We were just standing outside the St. Hubert restaurant. Didn't we end up going to McDonald's? Well, maybe yes. that was the time yeah, before. Yeah, no, yeah, I don't McDonald's. know. The time this before time. we were able to have the a meal. Yeah, but, yeah, 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 yeah. Just, yeah that, all right, man. Thanks. Thanks for everything. Hey, all the best. Thanks for your time. Okay. Say hi to Rob and Chris for us. Okay, man. Have a good afternoon. Yeah.